hello everybody. Um, this is our first experiment in more kind of panel audience participation. And really, I think I'm thinking that there's not going to be an audience here. There's just um, eight of us here chatting um, in the Hermetics uh, community, uh, across the Hermetics community and Doomer Optimism Collective. Um, and we're just going to be talking. So maybe we'll just start. Uh, let's let's introduce you, James, just because um, you're you're kind of a special guest and and also host, I guess, as well. So James is is host of the excellent, extremely excellent uh, Hermetics podcast, and we've had you on before as a guest, but now we wanted to kind of like continue this this kind of line of discussion. So do you want to just introduce yourself first for everyone else? Yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. For those that don't know me, yeah, I um, I run Hermetics podcast, which talks. We I mostly talk about um, forgotten thinkers, uh, overlooked thinkers, and I I haven't done so much recently. Actually, one of the recent episodes was on collapse and what we what we all here probably consider collapse and what we'll be talking about today vaguely collapse stuff. But um, it's funny, you know, Jason me, Jason was just saying to me about how you know. We couldn't really hit me and me and him and Ashley probably couldn't have another conversation with me as the guest, simply just us three on collapse. Cause it's like, I think strangely, I don't want to put this as a downer of like, we haven't got stuff to talk about, but once you're in the collapse sphere long enough, you're sort of like, Hmm, I don't know what more to talk about because the, the end of collapse theory or collapse in general is like, once you sort of accept that you sort of start, you know, bringing it into your life, collapse down, avoid the rush homesteading, minimizing, whatever you want to call it, simple living, good life. And so it's like, yeah, I don't really have too much more to talk about. Like I've wanted to talk to Dmitry Orlov and John Michael Greer on Collapse again, but they've also all accepted like, yeah, we wrote about that and now we don't know what to do with it like anymore. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of interesting what happens to discussion on Collapse once you've got to that point where you're like, well, let's just get on with collapsing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I don't do like, that's basically to say, I used to do way more episodes on collapse and now I don't for that reason, really. I like, I want to, but it's sort of treading the same. It's like, yeah, we know oil is going to run out. Like I can't really mention that again. Uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, but it's, but it's, um, it's speeding up. I think we spoke about it this in our chat, like it's speeding up, but not like accelerating, but like, like just today, right? Like one common collapse thing that people overlook, like Germany said they won't have, um, wood for heaters or like they won't have loads of heating appliances or means to heat the uh heat heat people up in the coming winter right and it's just like one of those things that yeah we just want to have it i go okay right and you know i think for me the interesting part is something uh, something about like the the contours the details of what happens and if there are like the the general thrust of doomer optimism is is um not just like describing um describing what's happening but also like sort of using game theory to think or game theory or just thinking about possible scenarios and and figuring out how you might tip things in one direction or another um and what might motivate people um you know we, we talk a lot about like material uh, reality motivating people but then there's just like this interplay with culture that I think super interesting and of course I'm always worried about like just widespread suffering or widespread like manias psychological like cults and that kind of thing and I just tweeted today like be a normal person this weekend and then people are like what does normal mean blah 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 and it's just like you you know I, I don't know maybe you anyone else here has a thought on this maybe Josh, do you have a thought on what uh, on on being a normal person and keeping your 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 head straight and collapse? I think that's like a main concern of mine with doomer optimism. Well, I'm gonna have to call you out. I mean, you should know that normal is a problematic term because you're centering, you know, neurotypical people or or whatever. So you kind of get docs on social justice points for using that. Um, <clears throat> what is normal? I, I, you know, I think, I think that um, I, I'm on the same train with you, uh, and I've been having a, a good conversation with a, a good friend of mine who is an academic, and he is in, uh, he's like a geographer and anthropologist kind of guy, and I, 
it's one of those maybe you guys have had conversations like this where like you think that you're disagreeing but you're not really disagreeing and you agree more than you think but then it, then it's it's like it's like a conversational equivalent of like when you're walking down a hallway and someone's walking towards you and you both like dodge the same way yes it's super <laughs> awkward it's like uh, uh, you know and and i think you know and I, I and i keep coming back to like i feel like most regular people are fine you know i mean it's it, like if you look at the news or social media or twitter or whatever it's like all of the crazy turned up to 11 of whatever what you know and you find your sort of like tribe of people and, and your sort of flavor of crazy and and ride that but most people are just they're fine they're chill you know it's you know the i think like um we really need a boogeyman or every every group needs a boogeyman right and you have to create like the scariest possible most horrible possible boogeyman right and everything that occurs in the news is going to be like you know uh you know the boogeyman is getting closer and knocking on your door and he's coming for you, you or your children or, or whatever you know and um it's a, it's totally exhausting and so I, I like that you're like yeah like just be a normal person you know enjoy yourself hopefully the weather will be good get outside play with your kids cook something on the grill and i think the other thing is be able to relate to people um to the extent possible obviously you don't have to get along with everyone but what you're describing in your conversation is something I've experienced too, where almost people feel an allegiance to their tribe, like they need to signal that they're of a different tribe, even if they're agreeing with you on the content. They're like, no, but, and then XXX word that signals that they're part of a different tribe than you. Um, and it's just, the, I think that kind of thing is really destructive. And that's the kind of thing I've, I want to fight against. It's like, no, we're saying the same thing. And, and Joe Norman has given me, uh, grief for changing my language depending on who I'm talking to but sometimes I do change my language because I know we're talking about the same thing and I just am saying like you know I'm saying the same thing as you if I if I say you know um homesteading or regenerative agriculture or low carbon living <laughs> and he makes fun of me for saying low carbon living because he thinks I'm like with um, a guy with a guy who like works for the W World Economic Forum <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, I yeah, mean, we're, we're into low carbon living. We're not a threat. Don't worry. Um, yeah. You don't have to like well, shut down our operations or our small farms yet. Just leave us alone. Well, it's like we're with you, you know, uh, Christy, we're saying the same thing, meet at Emerge Conference. Chris, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. Because, um, yeah, I was at the Emerge Conference and there's a lot of like interesting thinkers and theories of change. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I think basically we had this sort of like small agreement about how we can't go back to normal. Um, and, and, and by normal, we mean like, um, like the industrial ways of doing things, um, hyper industrialization, for example. But there's always this sort of like wedge between like reform and revolution and where does the state come in, um, in catalyzing this change and where does it uh, come from bottom up? Um, so those are the sort of like questions um, I was like swirling with the entire weekend, but um, I found that people had rich perspectives in each of them. Um, so it was just a matter of tying these uh, threads together and doing the mimetic mediation of it. Mm -hmm. Chris, let me let me follow up with you with that. Uh, since you're at the Emerge conference and you know, the Emerge is kind of like this collection of like galaxy brains, you know, systems thinkers and metamodernists and integralists and uh, solar punks and you know all these people trying to imagine a protopian future um, that's the the term I think that's in favor now uh, where do you like how is the the conversation that they're having you know around kind of signals of collapse of our current civilization and potential you know possibilities uh, cultural possibilities um, you know how is how you know what is the nature of their conversation and how how would you relate it to kind of what you observe within doomer optimism i think a lot of them were talking about coordination incentives um finding out what is true and i guess from the sort of perspective that that i've been learning with and, and reading on on your guys's sub stack it's it's that um I feel that they're very mental and compartmentalized. Um, whereas I found um, Doomer Optimism relies a lot more on praxis and 
what we'd call um, the the first uh, part, which is like triage, the triage stage, where we're trying to like navigate like um, average everyday normal people. So I didn't really I didn't really get much of that when I was there, but I, I think I, I think they go for like like the the, the deeper underlying questions, um, but not so much how to bridge to answer those questions. I want to I want to see if uh, a narco contrarian has anything to say on the on the be a normal person topic. <laughs> I think it was I think it was my my uh, post that uh, inspired yeah, yeah, the retweet. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, there's kind of a lot there for me. It was and I had to explain it. I can't remember who sort of challenged the notion, but for me, it's you know it's not neurotypical versus non neurotypical. It's just like hyper online versus like uh, walk in life, uh, be, be a normal person, get, get outside of your basement, uh, have a beer type of thing. Um, so, so that's where it was coming coming from me. I mean, I, I think we have the tendency on Twitter certainly to have like great conversations, but, and this goes along, you know, your lines of thinking actually like great conversations, but not a lot of action or, or at least not a lot of documenting of the action that we do outside of Twitter. And to me, that's where all the good stuff is like we can have these conversations, but it doesn't mean anything if it's not tangible. Um, you know, and I personally am really passionate about you know bridging the political divide or repairing it in whatever way, or at least um, at least uh, progressing beyond it. Because um, to me, it doesn't seem uh, terribly useful, and, and maybe that's a function of how I grew up and the scale that I, I grew up in. You know. Um, uh, the sort of town meeting model was very popular and, and people certainly had plenty of political disagreements, but like it was reserved for like a very specific time of year every year. And then the rest of the time um, you go about and be a normal person and really just rely on your neighbors and help your neighbors out. It didn't really matter what their politics were. So, um, you know, I realize that maybe that's like a little bit of a privileged background, but um, that's what I, what I sort of frame the conversation in. And I love there was a response like, um be be normal and um and drink ice cubes in your beer and you were like no <laughs> get that out of here that's disgusting <laughs> <laughs> no but i do think there is something about the scale um that you grew up with that that a lot of us are are thinking about and trying to move towards um the hard part is that like most people do not have your experience with that scale of governance scale of like community um so even learning how to be like normal and work together with people is is hard for people like just just figuring out like how do I relate to you how do we necessarily have to work together and if we think about politics in the U.S. like almost oh everybody thinks of it as like I vote for the president and that's like the extent to which I am involved in politics they don't they're usually not forced to do local politics in like any substantive way. Let me let me uh, slightly challenge this notion of just being a normal person, because at least in the American context, being a normal person means being, you know, sucked into the consumerist lifestyle and always chasing the next thing. Um, yeah. And I almost feel like there's there's kind of like a barbell or like a horseshoe thing going on where um, there are still a lot of like normal people in the good way, kind of in the localist, like building community very civically minded. I mean, my 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 mom and, and stepdad are very much like that. They're not really online, um, but they're very, they're part of a Grange Hall, they're part of a religious community. They're very active in their community. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not memed into it by social media or localism or none of these terms make sense to them, right? Um, at the same time, there's like this, you know, hyper online set of, you know, esoterics and galaxy brains who are have memed themselves back into like, oh, we need to like embrace the real physical world again, right? And that's kind of like all of us in a way. Um, and so there's kind of like, you know, and then there's like this vast middle um, of like the, the kind of like intuitive localists and the online localists, right? And then there's vast middle of like consumer society. And that's not the normal we want to preserve, right? And so how do we, you know, just saying be a normal person, like, it's nonsense like like normal being a normal person just means you know following the civilizational trajectory that's killing all of us so so we need something a little bit more nuanced than that so i'm throwing that challenge out to to you guys yeah i mean that um no no nobody hears that louder than me you know a little bit of a little bit of background right so <clears throat> I, I grew up 
for those of you who don't know, I, gr I grew up in a very, very small, like Norman Rockwell esque uh, village in New Hampshire. Uh, at the time, a third generation of the third generation dairy farm. Um, right now, it's very much pre in preserved state. There, there's uh, four generations of my family that live there now. Um, and I did, I did what was considered uh, normal at the time, right? Uh, upwardly uh, hypermobile, uh, first, first person to go to college, leave, uh, and it, as it turns out, uh, basically never come back, right? So that, that to me, like, that's normal. You're right. That's totally normal. I, I followed the flow, the current uh, that took me away from, from you know, what, what would have been um, probably the better, the better way to live. It's, it's certainly, you know, what we are considering, considering here in the group, the better way to live. Um, so I wanted to, I guess, counter, counter with that. I to totally hear you, totally hear you. I was simply just trying to give people permission to like turn their brain off uh, for a weekend on the 4th of July and have a couple beers and like relate to your, your normie neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what James thinks about this. Well, I, was, I once heard it said that with this whole idea of like, um, disagreements, like micro disagreements or in-house fighting, I once heard it said that like, if you want real disagreements, you get two people who are basically the same, but they agree on like one minor issue that explodes. Like they, they hate each other right by the end of the chat. Whereas if you get like an atheist and a Catholic or like, I don't know, a normie and someone such as ourselves, it's like, it's so far apart. You're like, ah, oh, whatever. Like this is a laugh. But once you have that small, like, no, I'm not a solar punk. I'm a, you know, like that, this new thing they found, those people tend to like, hate each other so bad that it's like god if we just you, like you said earlier we're talking about the same thing um we just need to get along but on this idea of uh normality i mean it's starting to sort of i feel i'm becoming more and more distant because we spoke about this in our chat about that back there back back when we did our chat there was a video going around of uh i think at that point it was someone in like one of these hip cities like here's my and these are real they're the rage right these videos of like this is my average day in new york or my average day in toronto right and there's a new one out which people are going crazy about and to me it's like insanity like so i i, I the, the the idea of like urban normal what most people consider normal is getting further and further away like this woman was like her day started with like getting warm wrapped cinnamon hand towels to like just dab her face and then drinking like orange water and all this kind of thing and it's like this is like, this is so, so far from my basic standard of living, what I consider normal. And it makes me, makes me really does make me think I was talking about someone about collapse the other day. And like with John Michael Greer's idea of collapse now and avoid the rush, I think, I don't think we are going to see collapse because if you just live a normal, simple life and understand that things are finite, the idea of like, oh, I can't get, I don't know, sugar puffs today, or I can't get like in Germany at the moment, like I can't get wood. It's not like an existential meltdown. You're like, yeah, that's, that's how the world works, right? But with the social media thing, I've become like increasingly jealous of these accounts who were really big at one point and they're just gone. Like I sort of wish I had the courage to be like, yeah, I'm just done, but I sort of need it for work. But now, I don't know, I, I'm having fun pushing views that are slowly becoming normal for me, but are so not normal for everyone else. Like, Today I did a tweet about like state education. Like I, I've, I hate school. Somehow hate school now more than I did when I was in it at like <laughs> ten or fourteen. Like the more I see it, I'm like, this is the most destructive force, like in in, in government institutions generally. I don't really like the state, right? I'm fine with like a tiny amount of state for with a I don't know like a citizen military or something just to keep things orderly. But public school is like. Wow. And, and just saying to people like, yeah, I don't think we should have public school. That's like, you know, that, that sets off an alarm of using social media to just throw in like seeds, which normies consider so absurd that they've, they, they like, it's like a shock and they realize they've never questioned it. I think it's good for that, but equally I am, I am like, you know, the whole, we live in a society thing. Like, Oh, if you hate, if you hate the modern world, why are you on? social media or whatever i just don't really know what to do with that it's like yeah it's fun while it lasts but i'm not gonna have a meltdown if i woke up in twitter if i woke up and twitter was gone i'd probably probably be like a big knot in my stomach just came undone a load of stress dissipates 
and get back to just normal life. Yeah, those are my random thoughts. So I, w- I want to tag on that and, and throw out some questions to see <clears throat> what your all's perceptions are. Um, what you were saying, James, about you're all right with like a little bit of state, you know, for like to keep things orderly and running smooth, but like we're in a kind of, it seems like we're in a, a situation where the state's just growing, 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 taking on more areas and more regulations and more bureaucracies and more administration and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And we've seen like, you know, some stuff in the news lately in the states with like the Supreme Court decision on, on abortion and stuff. And the, the, some of the conversations that I've seen on Twitter, more like in the sort of right wing side of Twitter, is talking about like federalism coming back into the conversation with the idea, which I, I, I don't, I never put a term on it, but I always kind of felt like if the people in Mississippi, they want to make decisions about the pe- what happens with the people in Mississippi, it's going to be different than the people in Massachusetts making decisions about what goes on with people in Massachusetts. And those states are going to just have to live with the fact that people in other states do things differently than them and have different beliefs in them. And, you know, and you might feel more at home in Mississippi, you might feel more at home in Massachusetts or whatever. And um, there's one of my favorite uh, YouTubers and podcasters, this guy, Aaron McIntyre. And he, he uh, has these really annoying, like, don't make me tap the sign kind of things that he puts up. And one of them is like, the people who want to win will always beat the people who just want to be left alone, right? So something I perceive, and I'd like to hear if you all perceive this too, is that the, like the kind of the faction that's in charge in the establishment and their attitude on, on uh, on the government, on the state, is they seem to be really not okay with there being people out there in the hinterlands who think and do things different. Like it's it's not it's not just okay that where they live, the policies are mostly in line with their beliefs and politics. It's like if there's somebody out in BFE and they're not in line with this, that is not okay, and we have to mm-hmm. kind of control that out there too. Now, am I paranoid about worrying about that? Or do you also perceive that 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 kind of thing is going on? Uh, I'm just going to jump in because I think you're completely right, which is why I've like recently come to hate the state even more, right? Because this whole idea of the people who want to just be left alone will lose against the people who want to do things. I think in terms of people's preference and energy, if the state wasn't behind a ton of the various political things going on, most people would just not bother, right? There would be these minor little groups of people who'd be like, yeah, we, we don't agree with your thing. And there'd be no impetus behind it. And most people would, most people I genuinely believe, and maybe I'm just completely wrong on this. 99% of people just want to get on with their life and just have like a normal life with a family. They're really not in that interest in politics. And it just amazes me. It's like, wherever you stand on these political issues, whatever ones I'm talking about, let's just call them X political issues, all this stuff that's going on. It just, I'm like, where? why has this gained so much impetus? And all I can see is that there is this sort of state, artificial state backing behind it, which is that if that wasn't there, there might still be people who are like, we don't like the people in the hinterland, but they would not have the energy or the resources and their preference would just die because they've got to live a life. They've got to get on. And so I just feel like the whole thing's a bit artificial. And the only reason people who want to be left alone can't just be left alone is because the state is like, just the state just wants power for the sake of power and that means not liking people who are like yeah i don't really want to like i I, i'm basically someone who's like yeah i pretty much there's nothing you could offer me now anymore outside of like books and food and maybe i don't know clothes every now and again in terms of consumption that like you could if you're like here's a yacht i'm not interested in a yacht because it's just a waste of my time you know or anything like that and the state just absolutely hates those people and needs to find artificial ways to either get you to consume more or to basically keep you in line in some sense like it's their worst nightmare to have someone who's like i'm fine thanks you know so they need to make a way to basically make you not fine which is where this all all this political stuff comes in because you can't just be like i just want to be left alone yeah it's annoying there you go i have i have have oh you go ahead you go ahead ac I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I generally agree with you. Um, and the only other points that I would offer, I guess, is like, it's not just sort of the totalitarian tendencies of the state. It's also the totalitarian tendencies of, you know, global corporations right now. And, and, and you know, uh, probably worst among them on this issue specifically is 
uh, social media, you know, and I talked about this in sort of my original Doomer Optimism episode, like we're too connected, like we can't be left alone and we cannot leave other people alone when we literally see them on our screens every single day. Like, you know, city people see country people drinking Bud Light, like that was the joke I made and riding around in their pickup trucks with a shotgun. And that's like, they, they can't even relate. Uh, that's too much for them to handle. And that's bad. And vice versa, you know, uh, country people are seeing whatever, you name it, uh, the crazy, uh, I work at uh, LinkedIn and look at my day and how obscure and ridiculous that is to them. They're, they're too connected. So, you, you know, like uh, as much as I would love uh, and, and I totally sympathize with the just leave me alone, it's like, uh, unfortunately, it's not, the power is not all in your hands. There's a lot you can do, absolutely. Um, but there's so much that connects, there's too much that connects us. Um, two quick comments. I don't know, my internet's kind of weird, but um, one I would say on the topic of like normality, the important thing for me is that right now we are in, an, in a historically abnormal period. Like the last hundred years or whatever is the abnormality. So like any, anyone who relates to that is like, um, or like it's Ashley, your your video is is cutting out. Yeah, you're lagging a little bit. Is just like a historical anomaly all the time. And then the other thing on the topic. Oh, darn it! I'll put some comments in the in the chat. Okay. Um, well, until you can get back, Ashley, maybe you could just take off your video. Okay. You guys go ahead then. Um. Okay. Here. Um, can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. Yeah, better. Okay, so just briefly, the other thing is like this uh, inverse totalitarianism, whereby people are sort of forced to be agents of the state or corporations against one another. And I feel like that's a huge thing that's happening, where it's like the people who are, they're like, they're sort of mouthpieces for either state or corporate talking points against one another. Um, and that's that. I mean, I think there, there. A lot of people just don't realize that they're being used in that way. Can I uh, ask a question, AC? And so I think there's like also in, in that way, and then um, and then others. Who, yeah. Yeah, you cut out a bit more, Ashley. So kind of, um, but if we can leave it there, Josh. Did you? I wanted to. I wanted to ask a follow-up question to AC that you're saying about, uh, you know, if you want to just be left alone, but then you're kind of in a non-power position for the people who are, you know, aggressively pushing forward. So something I come back to a lot is um, a lot. I think there's a sufficient, there's a significant overlap of the people who just want to be left alone and do their own thing, and like, you know, the people living out in the hinterlands and doing like, you know farming and, and mechanics that fix stuff and, uh, you know, uh, people that do construction and that sort of thing. And what I always come back to is like, you know, society can't function without this, you know, this kind of boring, uh, 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 non-glamorous practical functioning. I mean, we need food, we need stuff to be repaired, we need stuff to be built. You know, the infrastructure has got to be maintained. And uh, so, I, I feel like the, the, the class of people that is responsible for, you know, kind of making it, putting, stocking the shelves and all that kind of thing um, has a power in that, you know, everything kind of grinds to a halt. We saw a little bit of that with uh, the Canadian truckers protest, you know, a few months back. And the response to it was, I thought, quite frightening where, where you know, the, 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 the tech companies and the, co the government of Canada and Trudeau said, okay, we're going to freeze your bank accounts. We're going to confiscate this money that people are donating to your protest and all this kind of thing. And we're basically going to cut you out of the economy. They didn't send in troops to go and bash the truckers over the head with truncheons. They just said, okay, you're not going to be able to economically function until you, you stop this. So I think that they have power to push back against that kind of thing. But I think it's also an indication of the fact that people realize, hey, if there's no one out there driving trucks, then, I mean, all those urban people, like, where is their orange water going to come from, right? Mm -hmm. Like, where are their cinnamon towels going to come from? You know, and they can't, and, and, you know, I get on my high horse about this. It's like these urban quote unquote knowledge workers mostly cannot do anything for themselves. They can't change a tire. 
they can't fix a leaking sink. They have to call somebody for everything, right? So there, if the infrastructure starts to become a problem, they're really going to be vulnerable. And I wonder if like a deep down knowledge of that kind of thing is producing kind of cognitive dissonance that's in turn fueling this like lashing out, you know, against the chuds out here in, in the red states. But I just wonder what you all, and especially, especially UAC, what you think about the, the power inherent in people who can actually do practical things. Yeah, I mean, I, when you can do practical things, you gain a sense of autonomy that other people don't have, you know? Uh, and I just sort of relate it again to like the, the place that I grew up. You know, I think uh, who the president is uh, has mostly not mattered um, in the community that I grew up for as long as I can remember, you know? Uh, and that's a pretty, uh, whether you want to call it privileged or just, uh, uh, you know, in general, a pretty uh, powerful and autonomous uh, position to be in. Um, um, so I think, you know, yeah, to, to instill people uh, with a little bit of sense of, hey, if I can take uh, back control over any small, tiny aspect of my daily basic needs uh, and do that thing for myself, that is uh, likely to have uh, a snowballing effect, right? Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, extends beyond uh, want somebody's daily life into their politics as well. Like, okay, if I can fix my car or fix my sink or fix my neighbor's sink or together we can all build a fence. Maybe together we can also repair our sidewalk or maybe together we can also decide what we all think about who knows what, guns, abortion, anything else. Like um, there is a snowballing effect. So I'm, I'm very hopeful in that sense, um, but there's just powerful, powerful forces that are against it, unfortunately. Yeah, I wanna throw in, I, I mean, I think, you know, it's almost a law of physics that when there's energy and power available, it, it will tend to centralize, right? And so, you know, in kind of a macro materialist historical perspective, this is all kind of inevitable. And, you know, it's not really left to right issue, right? Like there's plenty of right-wingers who would like to make like a anti-abortion mandate for the whole country, right? Um, so there's plenty of anti-federalist right-wingers as well. I and mean, we saw that with like, you know, um, after 9-11, you know, the Bush administration, with their, you know, uh, Department of Homeland Security, right? Like, there's there's plenty of of this to go around on on both the the left and the right spectrum, um, you know. So I, I think, you know, one thing that we talk a lot about in the doomer optimism sphere is this kind of biophysical reality and how it's breaking down. And in many ways, it's it's very scary. It's there's going to be a lot of collateral damage, and you know, it's all of us are going to be affected. It's going to disrupt our lives. But at the same time. Uh, if there's just simply less energy, less net energy to fuel the centralized control of hinterland populations, right? That's going to have a big effect in you know more regional autonomies. You know, if if the people in these regions are you know are willing and able and ready to to really stake that claim, right? And to really um, you know have the infrastructure and the skills. Uh, necessary and be ready to, you know, provide more for themselves and not have to depend on the centralized state or large corporations for, you know, for for their for their goods. Um, and so it's really, I think, up to us to not really worry about macro political power, it, uh, except to kind of defend ourselves against it when it's clearly overreaching, right? But to like, there's plenty of people who want to do things both on the left and the right who want to take over at a macro level, right? At a national level or a global level, um, they're going to keep doing that. Like that, this is this is just a trend throughout history, at least the last 10,000 years, right? Since the advent of agriculture, it's it's kind of a biophysical process that that just occurs, right? And so if we, if we understand where we are in that process and what collapse really means, I, you know, one, on an optimistic note, it can mean these more regional autonomies. And of course, we can still, you know, I can still talk to people from New England, like, you know, like I'm doing with you, Anarcho, um, and there can be this kind of, you know, transnational solidarity, right? So the Zapatistas, one of their concepts is Zapatismo, right? Which is like, yeah, you can come help us, that's fine, but you don't really, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're good intention, but you have unintended consequences. But really what we want from you is to create your own autonomies and then we can have a solidarity across autonomies. And that's, I think, you know, a great message for all of us, right? Because they're, you know, they're a group, for example, that 
you know, were being very clearly oppressed by the Mexican state and they fought back, right? And now they've, they've created that. Um, and I think that's an example for all of us. Yeah, I just, I just want to comment on this as well in relation to like um, the idea of thinking about economics in relation to energy, which people like John Michael Greer and um, uh, who wrote Small is Beautiful? Um, yeah, Schumacher. Schumacher. Schumacher, Schumacher, right? They think basically the only currency, quote unquote currency is energy, which makes complete sense. And I think as resources are um, beginning to dwindle and it's clear that basically what's happening is we've had a long time where people in a certain sense haven't had to make economic trade-offs because of the, com the comfort they were, they were in, right? So in terms of this anomaly, what the anomaly of the last hundred years and really the anomaly we're talking about is fossil fuels has allowed is one of the cornerstones of economics to be removed, which is when you make any sort of transaction, whether it's with your time, with your money, with your energy, with your resources, you are saying, right, like I have to make a trade off. It's either that or that, or it's this energy goes into this. My time goes into this. Like I've got, tw I've got 24 hours in the day or whatever. I've got 16 when I'm awake. What am I going to do with them? They tr you trade it off so you don't have to do another thing. And as the resources are becoming more apparent and, and, and that is coming becoming more apparent basically people are going to stop expending their energy on frivolous uh expenditures if you want to call them that such as the politics we're talking about such as you know putting tons of time onto various woke whatever it might be things all of a sudden that becomes a very apparent trade-off at the moment of course we live in a state where not only can you um still get your 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 food and your housing and all your basic needs catered for you also still have the energy time and resources to like bolster some various political thing because it's like kaczynski's surrogate activity right but as those resources begin to dwindle all of a sudden i just think i just think one governments aren't going to put money towards these things anymore and people won't put as much energy in towards them because you know when it gets down to more serious matters of like my house is broken, like something's broken, I need to repair it and no one's here to repair it, I need to learn how to do it or like there's food shortages and we need to put time into to, uh, doing food. All of a sudden, like you're just not going to put energy into a lot of these things. Um, and you know, like like as people here are doing, you just start doing that now and you're, you're ready. I mean, one of the big problems I think people don't realize is like, as you will all understand, people are like, well, if the, I love this when people are like, well, if, if things collapse, I'll just plant veg. Right, and I just yeah, just put the seed in the ground, man. Five tomato seeds, you get five tomatoes back, right? Like the 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 people need to know that like the learning curve to grow even like was the simplest thing to grow, like chilies or tomatoes. It's like that's long, you know. It took me, it's taken me like five years to get to the point where I'm like, yeah, now I understand how to get a good crop of tomatoes, look after them, know what to do, and uh, yeah, I think you know, Greer Greer talks about the Greer talks. Sorry, one second. Greer talks about the boomers throwing all their Xanax into a punch bowl and just having one final farewell because their worldview has just collapsed. But I think we'll also see that with like a lot of people, right? It's like the, the death of their new God is if they, literally, <laughs> this is probably sound a bit dramatic, but those, those videos of those people who are like have these very pampered urban existences, that is their world. That is their worldview. So collapse for them is that will be collapse. And I think it would be so existential that, quite literally if they can't get their like starbucks every day what is the point of living for them which is like that's depressing but that's just how it is if you've had starbucks every day for like your entire life and all of a sudden you can't have it that's like a cornerstone pulled out i have wait josh i know you're gonna say something but i have this just tiny story where um i was speaking with this woman who um there was a there was a um i think it was the blizzard in new york state that was so bad and um, she was staying with her in-laws and she told this story about how her mother-in-law um, was trying to drive to Starbucks <laughs> in the middle after this blizzard and was like, she goes to Starbucks every morning and she was trying to drive there. And the, the, what the, the daughter-in-law was like, do you think that the workers can get there? Like, if you can't get there, then like, <laughs> so like this, this, the whole idea of how their reality, a lot of people's reality works is like, all of this stuff will always be here. And it's just like such a shock in any situation where they're like, that wouldn't even be able to think through, like maybe there's a scenario where the workers can't get there to make me my coffee. <laughs> Josh, go ahead. Uh, I was just 
the point that you made, James, was that, oh, yeah, uh, if, if everything kind of uh, falls apart, I'll just plant a tomato plant or whatever, you know, grow a garden, no big deal. And I wanted to give a shout out to uh, a, a guy on Twitter, Tornado Nate, who's put it together, this nice thread, it calls like the Nate's Rules of Homesteading or something like that. But, and there's a lot of this kind of stuff, like on our group where it's like, wow, the learning curve for this stuff is steep and you make so many mistakes and it takes such a long time to get good at this stuff. And it is the kind of thing that, you know, uh, you can just pop up overnight and have all these functioning systems. And I, I, I reacted to uh, your, your comment because in me, it's like, yeah, well, this is stuff that people out in the country do. And the assumption is that country people are just stupid people and it'll be easy to reproduce whatever they do. I could just pick that up <laughs> in no time, right? Because I have all these degrees and stuff and therefore I'm really smart and I can just, I can just, but, but then I feel like, you know, you come out here in the country and you see like what working class people are doing and you realize, wow, there's an incredible amount of sophistication in all this. It takes a long time to get experience to get good at things. And there are huge prices for incompetence and inefficiency in all these things. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that, I, I guess it comes back to like the sort of city country divide and a lack of understanding that goes both ways. To be fair, it goes both ways with a lot of this stuff. What, do, what don't we understand about the city? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I, maybe I'm just trying to be ideologically generous and assume that you know i'm not i'm not privy to the whole world that they're in i don't know i maybe you all answer that i don't have a good answer for i that. mean honestly the the main thing with the city people obviously this is these are the people i come from is that they're just told their whole lives what what is the correct path and this is and all these people are just doing what they're told to be like good and successful um another comment i'll make um with the it takes time collapse now and avoid the rush is I think almost everybody who's aware of collapse thinks that the correct solution is something like what Chris was describing at the Emerge conference is um, something ideological in nature, something you can think and something you can coordinate through like good policy or, or like initiatives at like either the meso or macro level. And I could not disagree more. I mean, there's there certainly are some meso level initiatives, but the scale has to be small necessarily. And this is something we harp on a lot because it just takes a really long time to learn and to experiment and to know what works. And the only way you know what works is by doing it. Um, and then one tiny story I'll share is today I was um, power washing this brick floor of this old building we have. And I'm just like, there, the insights you get from just doing something, I mean, just like cleaning it off and I see that the, the mortar between it is just mud. And I'm trying to think like, how do, like how does building work? How, do, how does physics work? How do material, like what materials have been used historically? What's used in the industrial era? What do I want to get out of this building? Like what, what is my skill level? Um, and just thinking about like the people who made this, this building, like just so many insights. And I think the real optimism part, like the good life part is that all of that stuff is really fun. Um, it's extremely generative. Um, in the end, I'll make a beautiful space that I made myself, which makes me feel so proud. And I enjoy it so much more because I did it myself, the same with the garden or anything else. Um, and, and also you're learning so much, but you're also creating something like a real thing. I mean, on this property, I'll then have this this building that's a usable building that like my family can use and my children can use um if we keep it up so um yeah there's just a lot of real really big upsides i think like i agree with what ac was saying earlier just lots of virtuous cycles that happen when you start going down this path but you have to like i guess sort of force yourself intentionally to do it because when you're forced by like material biophysical realities it's a lot scarier and more traumatic and like you know, you're trying to get your Starbucks and you can't get it and then you can't get heat. And like, that's not fun and generative. Like it really does take some intentionality to try to do this stuff before you're forced to. Can I add a point? Please. Yeah, so I, I think like one of um, the advantages of like city folk is, is that they're very creative. They're, they're always like looking at trends. And one of the trends that I'm seeing within my city is like um, a more interest in locally made goods. And I think with the power of memetics and the power of like um, having a bunch of like people together, being able to converse 
with one another that you can sort of have these sort of I I guess they feel like trends or like like marketing sort of um, initiatives that that feel like you're just perpetuating the um, consumer's paradigm, but in some ways it can also revert to something completely different or something something quite entirely new that we that we're not really sure of. So I I guess I guess sometimes I think about like the interest in local goods can be can be more obnoxious than veganism. But I you know sometimes there are goods um sometimes there are good qualities within these trends. And it's just a matter of can we see these actions through enough such that there you can have something positive that can emerge from it. Yeah, I, I guess I want to add to that. I, I've seen some interesting trends in cities like Barcelona, for example, like they're putting a lot of effort into basically creating these localized economies, right? They have these fab labs. They're trying to, um, you know, use things like 3D printing and, and other things to, to kind of create local materials that, you know, with, you know, create circular economies, create their own currencies, things of that nature. And, and so, you know, again, I, I don't know if, if they were to get cut off from the hinterland, if, if that would be viable or not. But, you know, I, I, think, I think the question isn't so much urban and rural, it's, it's, it's what's the proper integration of, of cities into bioregions, right? And I think oftentimes the scale of cities now and the land footprint that they require to maintain themselves through energy and, and, and materials is very extractive, exploitative. Um, and so that needs to change. But the question then becomes, well, how, how does it change? Because there's been cities for a long time, they, they were much smaller before the age of fossil fuels, but you know, there were still cities of like a few hundred thousand people um, hundreds of years ago. Um, and in some cases, it was a more colonial relationship with, with rural areas. In some cases, it was a more integrated um, symbiotic relationship with those areas. And so I think that's, that's really the question because you know, as, if collapse is unfolding, there's a lot of people in the cities, right? Um, uh, for me, the question is how, you know, how do we right size cities? And, and that probably means creating kind of neighborhood autonomies, right? And claiming land for uh, say urban agriculture. And, you know, by the way, maybe that'll be possible because more and more people are moving to rural areas to be, to be productive and be land managers and farmers and things like that. Uh, and so there's actually more space to do that. And so to me, that's a more productive, constructive thing than, than this kind of um, uh, culture war between urban and rural. I wonder, James, um, if you have thought about or talked about um, any models from Europe that seem like a, um, a good balance of population and um, you know bioregion, because like, my experience in Europe, like I think about these Italian you know, walled medieval cities. I went and lived in um, Montalcino for a while, um, working on an organic farm there, a vineyard. And it was like, it felt so balanced to me. I mean, the amount of towns, you know, people in town was like, you know, maybe a thousand people, maybe 2000. Um, and then the outlying areas, it's like, you can walk to town from the farm surrounding. And I just feel like, there are lots of models. The problem right now, my sense is that like a lot of these towns are just emptied out in Europe. Um, but the infrastructure is there. In the US, we have less of that. Um, but I mean, I think where AC grew up, it might be, might be something like that, like a village, village scale. I don't know if you've talked about that at all. I think, I think once again, this sort of goes back to the idea that we're living in an anomaly. Because I mean, where I live, uh, Norfolk, which is the East Angling, coastline which is so flat and it's like our farming belt because of the the heat from the the, uh, the gulf stream coming onto the, the the east anglia and i don't know it, what i think one thing it makes me think in terms of people traveling around and this ease of travel and the the move away from organically built towns um to more towards the american model of like you can just put buildings anywhere because we assume that we'll be able to drive up to 40 miles for a commute right um is that basically this all moves moves from the the sort of the anomaly that agriculture now no longer takes a ton of effort i was like small towns would probably be built around the majority of people working in agriculture for most of their days being pretty tired understanding that 
growing your own food on a bigger level takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. And so you're not really that interested in moving around all that much. So the, the, the one of the problems I think you'll face in the future is like a lot of these small towns, which, which or used to be villages near me that are now bordering on towns or are even bordering on very small cities. Uh, you've just got these like artificial suburbs, just like you had this lovely organic thing grown around a community which had like a job around all the surrounding fields and then it's just like bang here's a here's here's a suburb and it's like well as you move back i don't know how this is going to work and so really like the whole landscape now is built around something which you know once again it's it's like it just it will make no sense going into the future and you know like greer in his novel stars reach you've just got these people who their job now all day is just digging up roads, which I found, you know, it's like a fantastic idea because no one, everyone assumes that if you had to get rid of a road, you would have the technology, which was there when you put down the road. It's like, nah, it's probably just gonna be like 10 people think being like really annoyed at the past, right? Like 10 dudes with pickaxes just being like, Oh man, like, I can't believe we did this just needing more farmland or just being annoyed that the road is there altogether. So it's like, it's just the, organic battling the the artificial once again but when you have to go back to the organic you no longer have the artificial means to get rid of the artificial so you're just stuck with this like a tumor right i don't know but yeah i don't know too much about models because i don't travel around all that much i like staying away from things you had a fair point um oh sorry go ahead man i was the only to speak to that point the only thing i was saying is just like you know we we lack now we lack a sense of like incrementalism, right? It's like the country or the mega city. And, you know, in terms of models, thinking back to, you know, at least rural New England or not necessarily rural New England, New England as a whole, like back, back in the day, you know, I think about my own town, it was known for its wool production, its, its sheep raising. And it was extremely remote, extremely remote uh, rural village at the time of the industrial revolution uh about 10 miles away uh by cart path uh was a a smaller town yeah you know, a, a larger town than that but it's still a small town uh grid, gridded town center uh against a river small scale manufacturing then uh 40 miles down the river larger city much more hydropower because it was a, a connected uh multiple rivers connecting together a major manufacturing hub down the river even more, Lawrence, Massachusetts, you know, at that time, industrial, uh, you know, mega center, basically. Um, and that, and I mean, if you just think of logistically speaking, like that was, you know, uh, all pollution that happened aside in the industrial revolution, like that was an incremental uh, synchrony, if you will, like, right? Um, and we lack all of that now, it's all gone. Um, and, and you can, you can draw that tangent to our from our supply chain to our politics um it's all that incrementalism is gone it's like you know people don't even participate in their politics whatsoever because they expect their u.s senator and their president to figure it out for everybody um so if we can try to regain that sense of incrementalism both logistically and economically and politically um that that's the right direction Josh, did you have something to say? Uh, yeah, you had a little bit of a start of a conversation at one point about um, creating new, like uh, Im imagining what some of the disciplines of the near and medium future are gonna look like, like new occupations, new jobs and stuff. And I'm, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about, yeah, like a new kind of engineering discipline, which is like a scavenger engineer, somebody who knows how to repurpose infrastructure that was created and it made sense at the time, but now circumstances have changed. But it's still sitting there like James brought up the idea of well we're going to have to tear up roads or we're going to have to what's going to happen with the suburbs when the conditions that have supported suburbia start to degrade you know are you just going to walk away and leave all that there well like what kind of jobs would be involved in repurposing a lot of that stuff and figuring out how to repurpose it how to take it apart how to preserve it you know we've operated for so long on the idea that if we want more stuff then we just need to keep bringing more energy and resources into the system more innovation more invention and we'll just make all new stuff all the time. Somebody posted on Twitter about the, the sustainability thinking is like, get rid of all our old unsustainable stuff and buy all this new sustainable stuff. And that's how we do sustainability. Provided you keep like feeding new stuff into the system. But at some point, I think we hit what John Michael Greer called the, the catabolism, right? Where we actually start disassembling things and rebuilding and repurposing. 
So I'd like to hear from you all, you know, I mean, we have all these sectors that we need there, you know, there's food and there's infrastructure and there's medicine and health and administration and all this kind of stuff. So what have you thought about would be like, if we can offer a positive vision for people coming into this, like, okay, well, in the near future, we're going to need more people to do stuff like this and this and this and this. And our institutions, as they're currently constituted, do not train people in those things because they're training people for the life that made sense 50 years ago. Okay. And it's going to look different now. So we're going to envision new occupations and roles that people can play where you have a role, you have an identity, you're productive, you have something you can base a sense of achievement and self-esteem on as, as a positive psychological support for undergoing. You could get all doomy about collapse, right? Oh God, oh God, I don't have my Starbucks. Or you could say, hey, we're going to go take apart a bunch of suburban houses and build this new thing that makes sense now. So what, what, what do you all think about that? All I'll say is that here in Uruguay, um, there's already um, a, a more expensive energy relative to the income people make. So um, there's this rural dumpster um, that like a lot of, there's, there are still rich landowners here and they sometimes will get rid of stuff that other people will be like, how could you possibly have gotten rid of this? So we call that like Home Depot because we, Every time we go to throw something out, we someone's someone's there picking something out, and we're picking something out that we're repurposing. Um, and for us, like we wouldn't, I don't think necessarily need to do that, but we like it for sustainability reasons. But people are forced to do it because they couldn't afford to buy a lot of those materials new. So I feel hopeful about that um, being something that happens. But the richer countries are going to like have a death grip. They're going to hold on as long as they can to like not having to do those things. So my my whole project is like, you know, trying to get some of these insights from what I would say Uruguay is like almost ahead of the curve in terms of like the temporal order of collapse because they're like uh they they didn't develop quite as 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 much and they're ahead of the curve in terms of like energy being more expensive for them. Um so I say, I look around and see what people are doing and, and say like, let's, you know, try these kinds of activities that, that um, you know, our livelihood activities, you know, people are building um, out of earth and straw and like pallets and bamboo, like little sheds and stuff like that. These kinds of things where it's like, people are relearning different um, ways that might have, maybe their grandparents did 30 or 40 years ago. And then now they're relearning and trying to do um, in their own way, but with with whatever modern materials they can get. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm like concerned that um, like if I went, I, I'm trying to go to like American universities and say let's do more hands-on activities, exactly what you described, Josh. Like let's do field schools. Let's get get these kids out into the world. Let's give them some skills. Let's get get them to um, to see like the lived reality of sustainability, low carbon living, <laughs> they, they don't buy it really, you know, they're like, no, let's, let's train them in tech, you know, let's train them all to code or whatever. Um, and I'm trying, but I, I do think like people, people, I think historically will just dig their heels and they just think the way it is, is the way it always will be. And so I just, you know, I, I do, I do think that it's only going to be a small group that actually forces themselves to collapse and avoid the rush. And then I just think that there's going to be like a weird bifurcation that happens where there's like, or multiple um, groups that like have very different outcomes depending on what they're doing like right now. I think, I think with that, with that bifurcation, I mean, one thing I want, one thing that does, does concern me. And I mentioned this in our chat and it's something I think about so much. I mean, when people think about like resource shortages i think people i mean probably not people here but generally people think in a very quite a small minded manner so when people think of resource shortages they're like oh well if i can't get carrots then we'll just eat something else it'll be a bit bad or if i can't get this then but when you really think about the modern world like you know i mentioned this and i always i don't know again enjoyment in a way of mentioning this is quite a bit morbid but like the the general reliance or in the western world on medications and the fact that many medications are, are as i understand it constructed from dwindling resources or resources which require fairly specific and resource intensive extraction purposes and all of a sudden right you have this thing which is quite literally mandatory to 
uphold the anomaly of Western health, right? Whether it's heart medication, whether it's antidepressants, I'm not saying that saying that like if you don't have antidepressants, you will die, but they would be put into a state where actually they could. Antidepressants, heart medicines, things along these lines, that all of a sudden, like we act you actually, whereas with food, uh, X shortage means you move to Y, with medication, it's like you can't have a shortage. There is you you just cannot. And it's like that to me is that to me is one of the insane things that you overlook is like all of a sudden there is quite literally a time frame where if certain product isn't available for even as short as a week with heart medications, you could be looking at deaths of tens of thousands. And that sounds very dramatic, but that's the reality of the peculiar anomaly regarding resources we put ourselves into. It's just a small thought. This is yeah. weird, but I've bought like a decade worth of contacts because I'm worried that you won't, that like I won't be able to get them or like, cause they're, you know, just like manufactured in some one place, probably, probably there's one or two factories or whatever. And if those just have issues, then I don't get to see, or I have to work at the glasses, which are Chris, also Chris it's interesting. You know, you said medicine is an externality of modern society. I should have, I should have been more specific and said modern medicine. And actually you're finding more and more people online. There's accounts such as Grimhood, if anyone's ever come across him, um, accounts that are basically doing their own medicine because the medical system is, is gone. They're going back to a fairly serious form of uh, almost like herbalism or uh, using supplementation because it's all the same thing, but modern medicine, which is doing stuff that's super, super powerful and crazy. I mean, yeah, but of course, but then once again, this goes back to the credent, the idea of like why people, for instance, if you have like a blocked drain, it's like why people would rather pay a few hundred pounds to basically undo a U bend and bring whatever it is out and then just screw it back, right? People would pay, end up paying like one, 200 pounds because their mind has been attacked by the parasite of credentialism, which basically says like, if you don't have X credential, you not you shouldn't do this you you cannot you have not been trained and it's the same with medicine right it sounds really dangerous like you're medicating yourself it's like you can do the same research as the doctors and find a way i've done it myself for various things and it's but it's the same with same with anything like you can't take the brake you can't change the brake pads on your car you haven't got a mechanics license and that's like a very deeply rooted thing of like you need the credential and it's going to take a lot to 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 pull that band-aid off for a lot of people because they just don't believe in themselves but and that's schooling as well right you are a lawyer you do lawyer you are a mechanic you only do mechanic you know and i'm not recommending doing your own dentistry or anything but if you want to you know <laughs> i think you could clean your own teeth i think you could clean your family's teeth I that's food that. it's food fuji nine is the name of the um you can buy it online the, yeah what you use for fillings i actually think though that this kind of thing is extremely optimistic there. I see a lot of people like I'm in a lot of these mom chats and you realize it quite a bit with pregnancy and childbirth, like the over, over interventionist, like medicalization of pregnancy um, that like, you know, this maybe doesn't even actually have my best interest at heart, this whole system. <laughs> and then you like realize, well, you know, there are alternative ways of doing these things. And of course, like, I'm not advocating that like, I mean, I think some people like just hate and fear doctors for this reason, because a lot of times they'll like choose something interventionist that will actually be harmful to you. Um, I, I, I still like doctors for some things and <laughs> use them for some things, but I also think like, it's really cool. A lot of these moms I'm talking to, I think of Chelsea Norman, who's Joan jo Norman's wife. Um, she like knows so much about herbal medicine and in these mom chats, someone will be like, yeah, my baby has eczema. And she'll be like, try this tincture with this herb that you can find. And I find that extremely fun and exciting. Like, you know, as long as you're not doing anything that has like super negative downside risk, like Grimhood, like take magnesium, try to get sunlight, go outside. Um, those are the, those are the recommendations. <laughs> it's like, um, try not to, to like look at your screen at night after the sun has gone down because it will will like mess up your circadian ryth rhythms like these aren't dangerous things to do and it's really cool and empowering if you can see how your health changes by making these small um things i also think it's really like magical and exciting to do this kind of like apothecary stuff in your own house like we're almost like reinventing ancient um medicine um 
but we could kind of like pull from anthropological literature and do and like everything from human history if we wanted if we got into it so I don't know I just like I I honestly feel like there's something really cool and exciting about that and like when I listen to these moms talk about like I think of a happy holistic homestead she does this kind of stuff all the time she'll be like oh I, I do this with my she's got five daughters it's it's lovely I think it's exciting have you guys um, heard of the <laughs> box <laughs> real quick a book mm -hmm. um let's see if we can see this um I have an e version of mm -hmm. this this is just the a this is not the whole thing but it's the encyclopedia uh history of science technology and medicine in non-western cultures and it has so much of this kind of stuff. And I'm happy to share the electronic file with you all if you want. Yeah, please do. I was gonna say, has, have any of you heard of the Foxfire series? Okay, a couple of you. So the Foxfire series was written in the 70s. It was a teacher, like a high school teacher, a middle school teacher or something who was in a classroom. And at some point they, he just decided, you know what, this is, this is not conducive to learning. And so basically what he turned his class into is basically they, they went out to different parts of Southern Appalachia and interviewed old timers, right? Like 70 or 80, 80 years old at that time in the seventies. Uh, and basically just asked them questions about how they lived, both, both kind of stories and, um, you know, just, just kind of cultural things, but also very practical things. Like how do you, how do you build a, a wooden house? How do you butcher a pig? You know, what are, what are some, you know, um, uh, herbs that you can forage for, for medicine and for other things. And it ended up creating like this 12 book series, um, which I actually just had my wife get me for my birthday. So I'm glad I have that kind of in paperback form now. But I, I think that, um, you know, and it has, has basically all aspects of life uh, of people who maybe interacted a little bit with kind of modern industrial society, but were basically on the fringes and, and kind of more or less self-sufficient. Um, and I think every region basically needs this kind of thing, right? That's that's regionally appropriate, and of course, a lot of things are cross contextual and can work different places. But uh, you know, I, I'm I'm extremely grateful that this resource exists for my region, right? And I'm you know I want to start just just kind of pouring through it and, and and trying some of these things before I have to desperately search the book for an herbal remedy for something, right? That I have to do the first time. But you know, accumulating this knowledge and and you know putting it in paperback form that you know, can be used as a resource in the future, I think is, a, is an incredibly, or could be an incredibly um, powerful uh, activity to, to engage in. You know, coupled with what Josh, you're talking about, I, I, tried, to, I tried to meme uh, Salvage Core uh, into existence a few weeks ago, uh, you know, to kind of like contrast with, um, I don't know, solar punk or something else of like, you know, it's kind of like punk rock, you know, Salvage Core, it sounds kind of cool. Uh, and it's all about learning how to basically repurpose um, things from industrial civilization uh, towards, you know, towards our end. Okay, I was, I was countering cottage core. Yeah, I was countering cottage core, like these perfect press dresses. And, you know, they're probably millionaires. You know, they, you had a thought on this, actually, about, about you need like 10 servants to be able to like maintain this lifestyle. Um, salvage core is more punk rock. And it, it's all about, you know, so, it's, so it's kind of like this fusion of drawing from the past and accumulating those resources and then repurposing, you know, the things from modern civilization that that can still be useful. I would just add, like, I think that there are a lot of memes like that and maybe archetypes. Um, so the salvage core is like a punk rock archetype, like some scrappy guy who's just like making a living on the land, but it's also really beautiful and you can like salvage these things and, and, um, I don't know, like make things with your hands and you're like so self-sufficient and that's really cool. And then I think of these moms that I know and I think there's like there's like this archetype of like this witchy woman like making brews in her home and like curing people and like mother archetype, something like this. I, I just feel like there is, we're like just bubbling beneath the surface. There's like these archetypes that are, um, we're just waiting to inhabit, to like have a more magical, reality to like live in this more magical reality and I just feel like we're getting there little by little um but it's um yeah we're I think so, for for us moderns like life is just so sterile and narrow um but I think it's there's a lot of potential there and I almost like peek at it sometimes with these moments where I'm like doing something real like like um I started with kombucha and it's just like ugh, some weird like gross scoby thing 
and it's like turning this sugar into like something that's good for my gut health it's just like it's cool it's so weird it's so like visceral you know you just like feel like you're part of some visceral alive reality um I don't know it's just I I feel very hopeful about it it's it's very fun it's very magical Well, I guess um, we should probably wrap up pretty soon. Um, anybody else? Seems like we're, we're, that we're kind of ending on a hopeful note here. Um, I don't know if anybody else who's here, who videos are on, on Stan, Tristan, F56, et cetera, Charles, do, if, you, if you all want to add anything, um, uh, very curious, you know, the thoughts going behind the blank screen there, or if anyone else wants to add anything. All right, well, it looks like we're good. Uh, Gordon, you just came in. We were just about to wrap up here. So I uh, apologize for that. Um, this will be released at some point uh, as a recording, I think. Um, thanks everyone. All right, thank you. That was, this was lovely. Thanks, James. The, uh, we're, we're an obvious um, ally. So this is, this is great. I'm, I'm, we should, we should do this at some interval where we get together and, and chat about our, our various um, projects, the good life, uh, how, how our, our magic, the magic in our lives is progressing. Yeah, I thought, I thought about this for a while, like just, a, I don't know, maybe a monthly or bi-monthly meeting of people who are collapse or into like a collapse accepted group, right? It's almost like a, not a vent, but like a catharsis because you go out to the modern world you're like how are you not seeing this right and then you have a group of a group of people where you're like okay you guys are sane and we can actually talk on a sensible level i think it's a it's a good service it probably i think if we if we made this fully public as well i don't think it would be flooded i think it would still probably be workable right okay next time we will that sounds well, we great see, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah thanks very much it's been super fun it's been great to meet you all awesome cool. thank you Take care, everyone. Have a great Thanks, one. Everyone. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, guys.